So, hello, Patricia. Uh, Patricia is uh, one of the people that made this uh, event possible. And today she's going to tell us about uh, the vampire narrative as a domain in 21st century philosophies. So, let's get started. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I will tell you today about vampire narrative. Uh, I would like to first tell you if you have any questions, just put them under the stream. They can be either in English, either in Polish. I will answer in both languages, no problem. So let's go to my presentation, to my subject. I guess I don't have to introduce the figure of vampire to you because it has been examined and researched for a long time from, as I enumerated here, social, anthropological, psychological, philosophical points of view, uh, and many others. Uh, those are just few. Uh, mostly, uh, it was seen as the representant, the embodiment of other uh, in metaphysical sense as a representation of death, in psychological sense as a representation of unconsciousness, and in social sense as a racial, class, sexual, gender other. But also, and that will interest us most, uh, according to the subject of uh, this event, in philosophical or rather in political philosophy sense. Uh, here I briefly enumerated most uh, important uh, interpretation, philosophical interpretation uh, of the vampire. Uh, this is, for example, uh, the statement of uh, David McNally in his book, Monsters of the Market, when he tells that vampires are figures of capitalism or capitalists. Uh, however, in this book, he rather considers vampire as a metaphorical figure independently from vampire stories. I mean, he just tells that uh, vampire can be a kind of metaphor uh, as Marx used it. Uh, again, we have uh, Slavoj Žižek interpretation of Lacan. He tells that vampires are that thing with big T uh, who represent absolute transgression, which means they emancipated themselves from the realm of symbolic in which we, the real people, are all living. Uh, this is uh, seen in the absence of the reflection. Vampires don't have reflection, people have, so we are imprisoned in this world of symbolic, they are not. However, as we can see, this is true only for some kind of vampires, as not all vampires actually don't have reflection. Then Susan Chaplin, interpretation of René Girard's conception of scapegoat, uh, René Girard told that uh, scape scapegoat is a necessary mechanism of controlling social vo violence. Briefly, um, every society needs a scapegoat uh, to purify itself from the amount of violence which is necessarily gathered within, within any social group. So nowadays crisis, according to Chaplin, is due to the issues with mechanism of scapegoat and is reflected in good guy vampire figure. Uh, simplifying it, it means that if we have a good vampire figure, it means that there is no scapegoat mechanism working. And if it's not working, it just reflects that we have problem because we don't have a catalyst for our violence. Also, this good guy vampire figure shows commodification of contemporary uh, culture, uh, consumptionist and such things. As then we have um, something which I told in general as social theories of vampires as others. Uh, we can resume it in a few words that bad vampires representations, they show different conceptions of an acceptance of other because we have a figure of bad other, dangerous other, um, who has to be thought and conquered. And we have for that a conception of social exclusiveness and monocultural society. If we have a good vampire, then uh, we have a good other. So the narrative shows acceptance of others, inclusiveness, multicultural society. And lastly, uh, which is very important, we have the theory of objection of Julia Kristeva. 
Um, objection is, according to her, a domain of subjectivity, where gather all that is socially unacceptable. Impureness, wickedness, monstrosity, it is just um, a symbol, a figure, a domain, where we put everything we fear, everything which arouses disgust, but as well fascinates us. Okay, but uh, there, we, there it goes the problem, because if we concentrate on vampire figure only, as all these philosophers concentrate, which I enumerated, concentrated, it necessarily leads to simplification. As I told, when we have uh, bad vampire, it's conservative narration, uh, and if, when we have a good vampire, it's emancipated narrative. Then how do we explain, for example, Twilight? Twilight saga is phenomenally conservative. Even if Chaplin considers it little consumptionist, uh, and for her, consumptionism is not non-conservative, um, we have to admit that in every other aspect, especially about gender relations, uh, this narrative is highly conservative. Uh, so I claim that only analysis of whole vampire narrative as a structure can reveal true meaning of vampire stories. An intended one, uh, which means the meaning that author wanted to give, unconscious one, which means uh, the meaning that author didn't know he was giving, his social attitudes, which were transparent for him, but we can trace them down in the narrative, and even involuntary meaning, the meaning which author didn't want to give, but nonetheless gave. Uh, but this, I already explained, um, means, for example, that Stoker, the Bram Stoker, author of Dracula, of the most famous work on vampires, I don't think he would like to see his work as being extremely machist. He would rather think it as being uh, very um, heroic. Uh, but the fact is that um, this work is involuntarily matches and masculinist, which I will explain later. Uh, this structure is, as you can see, we have vampire figure, victim or lover uh, of vampire or slayer uh, figure and the slayer hunter figure. A victim or lover is always the stake of conflict between these two um, opponents. And vampire can be an in traditional narration. He is the object, the object, uh, the term I already explained talking about Julia Kristeva. And Slayer is a solar hero, the crew of light. But in more modern, new vampire narration, the roles are turned. So vampire becomes a solar hero and Slayer Hunter can become the object. I will briefly tell uh, about these three main figures. First, we go with vampire, of course. And maybe I should tell this right at the beginning. I will be telling only about fictional vampire. Here we have a short table uh, with com uh, of comparison between folkloric and fictional vampire made by Paul Barber. And uh, we have to tell they are quite different. Folkloric vampire was a figure invented in Slavian folklore from medium ages. And fictional vampire was a figure who uh, was introduced into Western culture um, in the 19th century. Uh, here we go with three types of uh, vampire figure nowadays. Uh, it's of course a bad vampire and few examples, an ambivalent vampire, uh, about which we cannot really tell if it is seen as good or a bad figure, and a good vampire figure, of course. Uh, I will proceed uh, chronologically. First, the evil vampire was inv invented. And uh, here you have the most famous 19th century realizations. It's Vampire of John William Polidori, one of the first vampire stories. It's uh, La Mort Amoureuse uh, of uh, Théophile Gautier, a French novel. And Varney the Vampire of James Malcolm Reimer. It was a story that was published in newspapers called Penny Dreadful at the, uh, at the time. 
we have the Carmilla of Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, and uh, of course we have Dracula of Bram Stoker. And this tradition uh, was continued in the uh, 20th century. Here we have the one of the first vampires movie, uh, Nosferatu, of Friedrich Wilhelm Murta. And then we have famous realization of Hammer Studio movies, uh, plenty of movies about Dracula with famous Christopher Lee in this role. And summarizing it, uh, vampire in this narration is a threat to our culture and civilization. Um, vampire is other, as I told, can be other uh, in racial, national, sexual, biological, class sense. His existence is transgressive, his death yet not undead, and his objective. So we can tell uh, he's a rebellion against uh, social, but even farther against natural and divine law. And he was a herald of anarchy, and his emergence in the society was a sign of fracture within it. Uh, there are also gender issues in it because uh, vampires, yes, there is such a word, uh, is uh, even more objective than male vampire. Um, firstly, because um, woman was always a kind of other, a femininity was always seen as a kind of otherness itself. And moreover, uh, vampires is a kind of rebel female. Uh, who revolted against the role of mother, wife, or virgin, mm. uh, roles prescribed to, um, to women at that time, who wasn't a passive enough. In the 60s and 70s, however, we started the evolution of vampire figure and the good guy vampire emerged. Vampire could be an artist, a policeman or a detective, so a guardian of, of social peace, and above all, a true lover. Uh, we have also to notice that a vampire uh, becomes narrator or main hero of the story, and that the narrative adapts vampire's point of view. Uh, the figure of a hunter slayer, uh, he was, he emerged and was primarily male to gender, heterosexual, white, middle, upper class, Western. So we can see he was an embodiment of social norms and values who are then considered as uh, uh, who emerged at the time of colonialism, uh, patriarchat, and all this uh, stuff which you already know about 19th century. He was a defender or restitutor of the order, and he was a vampire contra type. His weapons were plants, stakes, uh, fire, light, religious symbol, decapitation. Mostly all of them were phallic uh, in the sense of white Western sexually normative masculinity triumphing over vampire or vampires. Uh, most, um, most common is this uh, stake, which is a figure of phallus on this picture. We can see it, I guess, quite clearly. Uh, decapitation, which is a symbolic castration, and light fire, who is also a male element. Of course, a figure of a slayer evolved with a figure of a vampire, and we can have in this new kind of narrative a bad uh, a vampire slayer opposing a good vampire. This bad one is always fanatic, fighting good vampires. But even in this traditional kind of stories where we have uh, bad vampire and good slayer, there was also a kind of evolution because nowadays vampires can be female, can be people of color, can be sexually non-normative and can come from lower social classes. Uh, the third element is a vampire victim. And uh, she was usually female, virgin, innocent, uh, supposedly passive, subdued, gentle, guarded by her solar heroes, guided and controlled by men. Uh, she was supposed as a good female to follow the path of virgin daughter, then become wife and mother. Although she wouldn't be able to become the victim of vampire if she wasn't somehow susceptible to vampire seduction. So she could become the stake of conflict between hunter and vampire. And for that, she represented control over society. Uh, 
and their henchmen was the domain, the area of conflict in which hunter and vampire were fighting for the control over the society. Uh, why she victim was usually female? Female was always a kind of other, as I already told, and that that's why she was susceptible to this vampire seduction because she had a lot of common with vampire. Here we have a table where we show that femininity was associated with carnality and the matter uh, with, in Aristotle's sense and masculinity with spirituality and form. Of course, these feminine things were also associated with vampire things. And vampire was also a kind of feminine fi figure even if he was male because he was kind of uh, bisexual uh, in the sense that he mixed feminine and masculine. He had this penetrative organ as a fang, but he also had absorptive organ as a mouth. Uh, vampire was a symbol of transgression of social norms repressing female. In the other words, when he was seducing her, he was also emancipating her own sexual desire, desire that she should not have according to 19th century norms. Uh, for that, vampire was fought by the men heroes. A female was to be protected from vampire's influence and if protection failed and she was turned into vampires, then she had to be killed. Because such a changed woman, she could not be restored to the society. She had to be killed with symbolic phallus of her men and go back to the passive role. And um, here we have my, my short diagram when we show that this Western culture, it was represented by men, solar hero, ward, heterosexual Western, with will of domination, strength, courage, and honor. Then we have women who had to be put under his control because her biological conditions were a kind of a threat to the society. And here we have a contra-type, vampire, but uh, in real life, those were, for example, all the, peoples, all the, the people of the, the East. And he wanted to seduce women and had to be blocked by and defend, but men who defended the woman against the other. Of course, they were defending her in a literal sense, defending from the death, but even most important was to defend her from, um, from the moralization. A uh, fight over the vampire was uh, actually a fight uh, for the domination over the woman. And we can also tell that this male vampire, even in, when he was a transgressive figure, was still only partially transgressive um, because he gave female victims sexual emancipation, but not social one. He was always also a masculine heterosexual figure. Uh, plenty of uh, researchers were even telling that vampire incorporates basic fantasy about the rape on the defenseless passive female body. Uh, from this point of view, vampires was a figure of female empowerment, and for that uh, um, she was even more dangerous. She, she represented lesbian values or, again, the reversal of gender's relation if she was attacking male victims. Uh, here we have a table comparing why female vampire was in fact more dangerous than male one. Uh, we have also to mention here that at that time uh, there was a theory telling that uh, females are naturally masochist. Uh, this is in their nature to be subdued. Uh, so that, um, and males are naturally sadist. So that uh, extreme sadism is still a less, in males, is still a lesser deviation than masochism. And in females, ex, uh, sadism is the biggest deviation we can have at all. And here we have uh, the comparison of a good woman and bad rebel woman, um, and impure femininity and idealized femininity. And uh, passing to this new vampire narrative, what happens in 21st century? In 21st century, we have a good vampire who takes place of the hunter, who is now a solar hero. Uh, this can represent many things, from minorities' emancipation to relativization of values. And our uh, diagram starts to look like that. We have a vampire who represents Western culture. We have a woman and we have a contra type. As we can see, uh, to be honest, not uh, a lot changes. We just have a good vampire against uh, an evil vampire. 
and woman is still protected and subdued. Even we can tell it's now more dangerous because in the old schema, still this woman had a, an issue, a gate to escape uh, the social oppression, even if she was blamed for that and finally killed. But if vampire becomes everything, solar hero and the, the, the escaping gate at the same time, she has no place of escaping. And that's what happens, for example, in Twilight, when she chooses this transgressive vampire and still she ends up in highly patriarchal relationship. So we can tell that really emancipating this discourse is relatively rare. It could look like that, uh, that we have a vampire, good one, and as a contra-type fanatic hunter. But still, woman has a passive role in this. Okay. <laughs> and um, then when there is a vampiress, she's usually also, even when there is a vampiress, she's usually also in the victim position. Those uh, narrative can be seen as the exception. Uh, I hoped I proved that uh, only the analysis of a whole narrative structure reveals ideologies which are embedded in the narrative. And now I can briefly, uh, in last uh, five minutes, go back to philosophy, a uh, pure one. Uh, as we could see, every ideology can be embodied in vampire narrative. But what in general vampire narrative symbolize? We have this um, triad, solar hero society and object, which we can easily pause that too. So, um, pause that too? Ah, okay. Um, which we can easily compare to the triad invented by George Agamben's. Uh, in his political philosophy theory of sovereign society and homo society. Jakubie, cinasz nam się z prelekcji. Okay, <laughs> okay, I'm continuing. And this, the conception of sovereign power was a conception of uh, someone who creates the law <laughs> and uh, for this was this power who created the law, created the society, but uh, also for that it had to remain outside this law, guards law, but is not submitted to it, which is already dangerous if we take in account the conception of democracy, for example. But actually, it is the basic rule of democracy. This is a great paradox, and uh, this sovereign power uh, has a power over the whole society. And uh, thanks to uh, the conception of bare life, every one of us has something like bare life and surplus, like our hobbies, uh, characteristic, and so on. But mostly, what is protected and what is also um, controlled uh, is a bare life. And then, then it goes the figure of Homo Sasser, uh, who is uh, the um, embodiment of bare life only, because it is a figure, a person who is out loud, who is rejected from the society and excluded, and the only thing which remains for him is uh, the bare life. For that, uh, Agamben proves that the conception of bare life doesn't really protect at all any life, because actually on the figure of Homo Sasser, uh, we can do everything, uh, we can submit it to every uh, medical inspection, uh, every movement from place to place. This is a figure of refugee, for example, of the figure of uh, these people, this body, who are um, uh, objects to medical experiments. And this is also the figure of vampire. So for that, we can tell that the vampire narrative is a reflection of the conception of sovereign power and bare life. And if you trust Agamben, that this conception is in fact the uh, reflection and the fundament of uh, modern society, then we can tell that vampire narrative is the reflection of broader structure of modernity. And I'd like to thank you for my presentation and um, 
and apologize for these little disturbances, technical ones. Um, and uh, I'm waiting for questions. Okay, yeah, sorry for the technical bit as well. Uh, so my question is, uh, do you have any more information about how this uh, medieval portrayal of, of a vampire became this uh, modern standard? Yes, um, this was a very interesting story because uh, um, vampire figure as we know it in the fiction actually started and emerged from the clash of culture. It was when this uh, uh, Austrian, Austrian monarchy uh, came to mm, this uh, Slavian um, possessions in uh, Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, Mostern Balkany, uh, the Balkanian Peninsula, and then uh, the uh, power, the clerks of uh, the empire met the um, customs of vampires, uh, of uh, specific burials, of the panic uh, with uh, vampire epidemic in these villages. And then the Empress, Marie Theresa, sent her um, special agents, we can tell, also doctors, to uh, really um, investigate the thing and see if, whether it's true or not. And at that time, uh, the uh, opinions in Western Europe started to be uh, really mixed. Uh, some of uh, philosophers were really discussing first if such a phenomenon as vampires can really exist. It involved Diderot, Voltaire and so on. And when they finally stated that no, they cannot exist even if in such backwarded countries as this countries in Eastern Europe, it's not really possible. Then they started to investigate why these poor people still believe in these vampires. And that's why this folkloric um, investigation researcher uh, research uh, really started. And uh, also at that time, uh, writers such as uh, George Byron, for example, uh, became interested in the subject. They thought, hmm, okay, putting this all philosophical thing and this all naturalist thing aside, it's a very interesting subject. We can take a little of it. And he first incorporated it into his Giao, very famous work. There is, there is a passage about vampire. And um, that's how gradually uh, it came popular. Even before Byron, it obviously came popular in German poems because Austrian were first to examine the subject. So that's how through politics it came to art and then to popular culture. Oh, this, that was really an interesting story, you were right. So maybe another question. Uh, how is it that uh, Agamben writes about vampires? Uh, is it uh, part of a bigger context? He, he does not really write about vampires. He writes about werewolves. He writes about the, the fact that in medium ages, we can tell uh, that uh, um, homo lupus werewolf figure was a perfect embodiment of the other. And um, examining and comparing this history uh, into vampire narrative, um, we can tell that uh, vampire narrative uh, reflects his stories even more than werewolf one. Uh, moreover, that uh, to be honest, werewolf figure and vampire figure, uh, especially in folklore, which I was talking before, uh, were kind of associated and even mixed. We have, for example, the figure of Vrikolak in uh, Greek folklore. Uh, was rather a mixture of werewolf and vampire figure. So it's only our fictional uh, world of 21st century that so preciously um, divides these two figures. They were mixed in a few folklores and they um, meant quite the same one. So if Agamben makes a close approach between werewolf and his figure of Homo Sasser, um, 
I claim that we can also make this reproach between vampire and werewolf figure, maybe even more. Um, a little of such an approach was tried to be made by uh, Nick Groom in his last book, uh, but he just mentioned it. I think that this conception needs to be um, um, developed because it's worth it. Uh, this is a long shot, but there's also this figure of uh, a dampier or vampire, half human, half vampire. Mm -hmm. uh, have you come across uh, it being analyzed in uh, such a sexual context, context as you did with the vampire? Is it a separate figure or do people not write about it at all? They do, actually, they, because um, this dampier figure, uh, it was. Um, it was also in Romanian folklore, it's taken from folklore. They were believing that uh, actually a vampire uh, can rise from the grave and come to his wife and she won't recognize it. I don't know how. She, she wouldn't know that her husband was dead, I don't know. And actually uh, make a son to her and this son was meant to be a dampier. And this dampier was... Um, meant to become a vampire slayer it was especially um, especially meant to it because uh, he had all the powers needed so a vampire is essentially a vampire slayer figure and yes it's also interesting that to this folkloric conception uh, authors of vampire narratives only um, they only took this uh, folkloric conception of Dampir in 21st century. Like in 19th century, it was completely forgotten because this vampire slayer uh, had to be a completely pure figure, as I said. Completely pure, clean figure, only male, cisgender, heterosexual, and so on. He cannot be some hybrid or something like that. Uh, but with the evolution of the narrative, evolution of the uh, of the of the of all the figures, uh, gradually also the conception that hmm, maybe this slayer doesn't have to be that pure. Maybe we can go to the folklore and take this dampier figure as a slayer, who will be a hybrid, a mixture, a guy with problems, not so pure blood one. And maybe we can take it. Uh, then only this idea emerged and we went back to folklore and took this figure, uh, which can be inscribed in this new vampire slayer figure, because um, dampiers are vampire slayers in these narratives. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think that uh, will be all. Uh, I just read the comments. Uh, great presentation. So that's also <laughs> my opinion. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.